maxed out. Why don't we go ahead? Um, All right. Go ahead. All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to our fourth virtual shadowing session. Thanks for coming. Uh, tonight's session, we're going to be covering a day in the life of an emergency physician and the challenges of being female. So that being said, I wanted to remind everyone about our upcoming sessions. Next week, we're going to be talking about COVID. And then after that, disaster medicine and global health. Thoughts from a UT Southwestern grad and her work through as a medical student, or her work with medical student clerkship. And then on July 21st, ultrasound and emergency medicine, the future of learning for dimensional anatomy. And so now I'd like to briefly reintroduce the working group. Uh, we have Reagan, Ani, Shayon, Miriam, myself, um, Alana and Rachel, and then of course the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Fowler, who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. So just take it away. Yeah, take it away. So welcome everybody. It's so nice. We're, our working group here is just uh, so flattered. By the way, uh, we're going to do uh, two uh, sessions for questions. Dr. Morchetti is going to be, uh, should be on there somewhere, and he's going to be uh, working on answering questions during the talks. Um, and um, we're so excited to be doing this. We've got over 130 universities, uh, students that have expressed interest. And this means a lot to us. We came up with this idea less than a month ago, and already it, it, it appears that being able to get shadowing time, I mean, if we did an hour every single week, that, and if it's uh, eight hours in a shift, that'd be equivalent of four shifts if I'm doing my math right. So as long as y'all keep doing interest, we'll keep doing it. And I will, uh, we will arrange to get uh, a larger Zoom account. We were at 500 now and we just maxed that out. So um, I want to tell you how honored we are tonight to have our colleague, Dr. Rashi Kedia. Rashi is assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern. She trained at Penn State. That's right, Penn State, right? Uh, she went to college. Yep. Yeah, I went to college and then she went on to medical school at Thomas Jefferson where she graduated in 2010. And then she did a four year emergency medicine residency at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I believe that's right, Rashi. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, joined us uh, not too long after that. And we are absolutely delighted. She is, in my worldview of things, especially as a single old man with no kids, the opposite of what you're gonna hear tonight with Rashi and her family, um, in my world, numero uno th about things, and you've, if you've been to the previous sessions, you know we've talked about this, how good of a doctor are you? And I will tell you that Rashi Kedia is a wonderful clinician. Mm -hmm. So we are honored to have her. Uh, she's gonna just, uh, go ahead and introduce your lecture and tell them what you're gonna be talking about, Rashi. Yeah, um, hi y'all, I'm Rashi Kedia. Um, Ray, that was a really nice introduction. It's very humbling to hear from your own colleagues. Um, we don't really get a moment like this. I don't think I've ever had a Zoom call with you like this before in weeks. This is nice. But, um, you know, Rashi, he, uh, Rashi, we arranged for 500 of our closest friends to join us just yeah. to see. <laughs> yeah. And this is really nice, Ray. Um, Dr. Fowler told me about this, and I was happy to do this. And it made me kind of think back to when I was in your guys' shoes and just remembering, like, how bad I wanted to get into medical school. And that's kind of all I looked at, all I wanted to do. And then I get in, right? That stuff was hard enough. And then you get in, and then it's like, then what? Um, and th that's kind of the funny thing about medicine. There's always just another step ahead. You're working really hard to get to that next step, that next step, the next step. And then you kind of grow up, and you're like, now what? Um, so I've been out of residency for about six years, and I've grown up. Um, and I kind of look back, and it was kind of nice doing this talk to think back to, like, how I used to think. Um, when I was in your shoes. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit kind of about my thoughts of going into emergency medicine and then thoughts of having a family while being a physician, not just in emergency medicine, but just a physician in general, um, becoming a person after all of this, and then um, life actually as an emergency doctor, which that's the fun part. I know that's why y'all are here, but um, anything else, Ray? You got it. All right. So I remember when I first got into medical school, I, you know, I was just happy to get in. I was so happy to, I'm here, finally, I did it. And then I had like these friends that were like, they, were, they knew they wanted to do orthopedics. That was their calling. They had broken their leg when they were 13 and that was it. 
And so they already knew all the orthopedic professors had already started research when they were in as a pre-med student and I had nothing. Um, I thought I wanted to be an allergist or a geriatrician. I didn't really know. Um, and I found that really daunting. I was like, I, I felt like I wasn't almost like good enough to do anything because I didn't know what I wanted. And so that was, that was kind of a stressful period um, on top of just, you'll hear first year of medical school as being pretty stressful with exams and tests and learning and stuff. Um, but you move on, you know, just like I said, medicine, they just kind of keep throwing things at you and you keep doing it. But then it got to the end of my third year and that's kind of, that's when you need to pick. It's like all of a sudden they're like, okay, what do you want to do? What rotations do you want to go on? What visiting rotations do you want to do? And I was like, I, I don't know. I, I really, I was like, I just love everything. And during my three years of medical school, I found myself like starting research projects in ENT and colorectal surgery and guide oncology. Um, and it was kind of like taking that step back, which is going to be kind of the theme of this whole talk, is taking that step back to reflect on yourself. Like knowing, knowing the type of person you are, because it's really easy in this whole little game that we're playing, you know, getting in, getting good scores, getting a 4.0. It's really good to just keep doing that, but kind of digging down deep inside of you to figure out who you are as a person is actually really hard. Um, and that's when, this is when I kind of look back and I was like, I, you know, I do want to have a family someday, which specialty is going to let me do that? Um, or, you know, everyone says it's a matter of balance, which one's going to give me the balance in the way that I find <coughs> Um, and so then I really, I was like, I like everything. And that's when emergency medicine kind of landed in my lap. Emergency medicine is everything. I got to do cardiology, orthopedics, um, minor surgical stuff. You know, it was actually a nice, um, a nice mix of it. And that's how I kind of landed in that, in those, in that boat. How about you, Ray? I, um, the thing I would start with first is saying that uh, everybody's career is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm much older. Um, and what are you, early 30s or barely 30, uh, Rashi? Yeah. Uh, I'm 67. The 30s, uh, yeah. I started, I started, I got in medical school 47 years ago. I actually, I started the University of Georgia one half century ago, you know, and I go, my Lord, how quickly this time has gone by. It's been unbelievable. I uh, started in pre-law. I don't, I don't know if I told you that, Rashi. I started in pre-law at Georgia. And my older brother, next older brother, was uh, in pre-law. And I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I just did not enjoy it. It did not make me happy. And so at the end of the first year, close to the end of the first year, I had a long talk with my dad. And my oldest brother was in just starting medical school. And so my father said, you know, you've always been good in the sciences, uh, good in math. Um, that stuff obviously interests you. Why don't you just give that a try and see what happens? And so in the, in the sum, spring of 71, I uh, changed my major to pre-med in those days at Georgia uh, with chemistry as my major. And I, um, I never looked back. Suddenly I was thrust into physics and calculus and uh, chemistry, of course, and, and organic chem, and I never looked back. I, it, it, was clear, it was obvious to me that my energy and my interest in what I was doing was, was much more acute. <clears throat> and, um, and then uh, there was a program at Georgia in those days where I could take my senior year at Georgia as a freshman in medical school. And so I applied for that and I got in, <clears throat> excuse me, and then I, uh, at medical school in Augusta in 73 when I got in, they were doing an experimental curriculum which would let you go year round for three years, um, which I did. And so suddenly there I was 23 years old and I was an MD and I go, my God, now what do I do? And so I did the honest thing. I got on a bicycle and rode to Oregon and uh, let my hair grow down to my backside and just became a hippie for a while and uh, went on to do research uh, on rat livers <clears throat> um, in, in the department of surgery. And then I went on to do a year of surgery, which I just didn't care for it. And so in those days you could start working the ER full time. You can't do this anymore. The term was called practice eligible. So in 78, I started working ER full time in Augusta, Georgia, and never looked back. I went back, then I went home in 1980, took over an ER, set up a billing company, uh, 
started teaching ACLS and uh, built an urgent care center and I blinked my eyes in 20 years past. And um, I retired at 47 and decided to do something nice and quiet. So I came to Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, <laughs> the busiest emergency department in the United States. So I, uh, I backed into what I, I backed into something that I liked, and fortunately, it stuck with me, and that's been a lifelong career, Rashi. Go ahead. That's awesome. I have no idea. Um, so I think, you know, kind of like you said, it's like taking that time to, like, think about who you are, and you have an opportunity with the people around you, like your father. You know, they know you the best. Same thing. Taking the time in medical school to actually see what other people are doing. It's really easy to want to learn, to memorize formulas, pathophysiology, but actually taking that time to see what other people are doing and putting yourself in their shoes, um, it's probably one of the most important things I think you could do, and it's just not stressed enough. Um, that will give you the best insight into a field, not just in the field, but a person's personal life. Take that time to talk to attending physicians, not just, you know, I feel like we're always trying to brown nose or look the best or like sound really smart, but actually just asking them, like, what did you do before you came in to the shift? You know, oh, you know, hearing that they're going through a divorce, like, ooh, what's going on there? You know, is that common in your field? Or, hey, I had time to go take my kids to a field trip before I came into a shift. Um, just getting those little insights and tidbits into the attendings who are actually living that life um, can really help point you in that direction that will make you happy and get you to this path um, where you're able to retire and go to work because you love it, go back to work because you love it so much. Um, and yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions. And just like Ray, you know, you can always switch. There's no, no saying that you can't switch if you want to, but I think if you take that time to be introspective to yourself, um, you can stay on that path that you want. Um, and then, you know, this is, this is kind of, again, just talking about taking that step out or looking at your, yourself as a person. Um, I don't think I really did this, to be honest. I feel like it's just laid out for you, right? You get into medical school, you get a job, you find someone, you buy a house, you have kids. That's just, to me, that's just how it was. I never even really realized that, hey, I can have a choice if I want to have kids or not. Um, some people are better at this than others, but just talking about it with people um, can really, you know, make you more open to these ideas and um, figure out what path works best for you. And then a little bit, you know, a part of this talk is about being a female physician as well. I think back of how I got into emergency medicine and I realized that I didn't have a single female mentor back in medical school. I never asked, how do you have a kid and go to work at the same time? And I never even thought about asking that. And I think if I had a female, uh, a female mentor to just even be like, oh, I had my nanny pick the kids up today. Oh, you need a nanny? I like, didn't even know that you needed a nanny. I thought you just drop your kids to daycare and you come, you know, pick them up when, you, when you're done with work. But having someone that kind of just talks about these things makes you kind of understand that life that's outside, outside of work. Um, it also makes it a little bit less stressful. Um, we'll talk about talk about a little bit about having kids. I you don't realize how stressful that becomes. And if think that I had opened my eyes beforehand, I wouldn't have been so scared after. Um, kind of talk about this as well as um, you know, girls. We like to go get our hair done. We like to get our nails done. Like how do you, how do you have time to do that? These little things. Um, that we just don't, we don't think about. And it's nice having a female mentor to kind of just show you that and shine light on these things. How do you find your own time? How do you have time to go to a gym and shop for clothes? And as well as have a good marital life. How do you cook dinner at the table? Have that on the table every single day. Having that, having a female physician, if you are a female, can help. I'm not saying that that's the only way I got through it. I became an emergency physician without one, but I think that's just kind of insightful. If I had taken the time to find one, one, even spent one day, one shift asking her these questions, I think it would have just opened my eyes a little bit more to my field. And then about having kids. That is such a, it's such a change. Again, 
in this whole field of medicine, like I said, we're so focused on becoming a doctor. We spend our whole lives. I still think of the time when I was studying for the ACT in high school and my mom was like, this is the last test you'll ever have to take. What? I look back at that, I'm like, what? There's like all the tests in college, the MCAT, step one, step two, step three. We put so much time and energy to become a doctor, right? But then you have a kid, there's not, I mean, you can read a few books, but there's nothing, but there's no one that can teach you what it's like to be a parent until you become one. Um, again, like I think if I've talked about it, even talked to my own mom, every now and then I still call her, I'm like, why did you let me do this? Like, how did you let me become a mother? <laughs> If I had just taken the time to talk to her about what is it like raising a kid, uh, what is it like raising me, um, I think that would have just, again, made it seem a little bit easier to do that instead of jumping in. Again, you know, people have kids all the time out of the blue. I had plenty of friends that had kids in college and med school and they did it. I'm not saying that you can't do it. It's just about being prepared, um, especially when you want to go have balance of work and life career how do you how do you do that and i think the more prepared you are the better that you can be at it and then you know another thing is i, I just thought about this when we just had mother's day and father's day just passed i never really talked to them about these things i would always talk to them about what field i wanted to go into why i wanted to do emergency medicine over gynecology or surgery i never talked to them about life growing up and I realized like having my mom home when I came home from school how much that actually meant to me I just took it for granted um, and the sacrifices that she did to do that and ultimately your family life the people that raised you are probably the ones that are going to have the most similar values compared to anyone else that you talk to and I think if I had taken that time to just talk to them it would have kind of maybe I would have just had one kid but <laughs> I think it would just open my eyes a bit more um, again, like I said, you don't have to change where you're going. It's just a matter of being prepared and kind of thinking about at what point in your life do you want to do these things. Um, being a mom is one thing, but also being a wife, I, I realize, is a whole other thing. Supporting your husband or your partner in their career, their ambitions. Um, I realize my, my you know, I'm home a little bit more. My husband wants to be as much of a father as I am a mother. And how do I help support him so he can do that? Because he does have, I mean, he's working. He works way more. He's just as busy, as well as helping him support the hobbies that he needs. Um, so kind of valuing what you're, what's important to a partner is just as important. Um, and the same thing is for me, um, making connections with friends, making connections with myself, finding my hobbies, um, really realizing that that's important. I may not have known exactly what I wanted, but I always said I wanted to play guitar one day. I said, oh, I'll do that when I grow up. But finding a career, or finding this path in life, or these habits in life to help make that happen is something you can start early on. Yeah, and that's kind of, that's why I was talking about my personal goals as well. You know, like traveling is so, like, I love to travel. How do you do that with kids? How do you do that with a very demanding career or where you're on call Q3 every three weekends, um, having a busy clinic? How do you do that and, ha like, fulfill your bucket list at the same time? Think of these things early on. Don't wait until it's late. You, one of the things that you, you'll notice as you kind of go down this medicine field is there is burnout. Physician burnout is a real thing. Um, and taking the time to just, again, just feeling your heart and knowing what's important to you can help prevent you from going down that route. Um, yeah, and it, I, I never thought of myself as a traditional person at all. I thought I was very career driven. I thought that I was, you know, I wanted to make a name. I wanted to write books. I wanted to be a big teacher in emergency medicine. And I ultimately realized that you know, I do like having dinner every night with a family. I like being home uh, when my kids are home. I do like picking them up from school or being home from that. Um, but then I've also realized that I don't want to pick them up from school five days a week. I don't really care about that. But so how much, how much do I want to compromise? Um, so just taking that, again, taking this time. I think COVID is a really nice time to do this. It's our time to reflect on what's important to us, what connections are important to that. So I think you guys are kind of ahead of the game by just, just by doing that and by being here um, and, hearing, and hearing the stories from different people around the country. 
Alrighty, and then so let's, I have some of the questions here. One of the first questions we have is, so I guess to you and Dr. Fowler, what made you choose emergency medicine over general practice or internal medicine? What stood out to you, I guess, that made you want to do that? For, for, um, me, it was, for me, it was different because, <clears throat> excuse me, because I sort of backed into it. I started working the ERs, found out that I really loved it. Year, one of the ways you know you're doing what you love is that you start doing it and years fly by because you're so involved in your work. And the years flew by. I, I got board certified uh, back in the uh, early 80s, and, uh, and I never looked back. I love emergency medicine because I can come and go. It's shift work. I can schedule my shifts um, uh, mostly the way I want. Um, I, I really like the diversity of what we see, which R Rashi is going to get into in just a moment, the, the kind of patients that you'll see all at once. Rashi? Um, I didn't really realize there was a difference until you dive in and you realize there's a really big difference. Emergency medicine, we kind of do everything. Um, internal medicine is usually a clinic or a hospital that you're in. Your patients are kind of already, your form is already there. You kind of know that this person's coming in with this problem. Whereas emergency medicine is a blank slate. You kind of are once figuring it out. It's kind of this detective work that you do that's so fun. Um, it's also fast paced. Um, I feel like in general medicine, you're, you're kind of you're seeing the same patients every day, you know, until they get discharged. There's a lot of rounding and thinking um, and calculating, which is totally fine. It's just, I think, uh, personality-wise, what excites you. Um, Rashi, let me stop you for just one second. Um, uh, I am muting all. I am muting all, all current. No. Rashi, you'll need to unmute yourself. <clears throat> Got it. All right, go ahead, please. All right, should I go on to the next question or did you? Yeah. Okay, so the next question was, what is the most challenging aspects of emergency medicine for you? Rashi, you go first. Uh, like, I guess it could be day to day, like in the hospital or like just in general. Yeah. Um, well, while, you, while you're thinking, I'll tell you, I, yeah. I think at Parkland, which is a large urban inner city hospital to which I'm very attached and Rashi is too, and Dr. Morchetti is with us, we, we, we love that place, but it, it's a big challenge. We send, a, we have an enormous homeless patient population who have nowhere to go. I mean, we can get them a ticket to the shelter if they'll go there, <clears throat> but a, quite a number of our patients, literally, it is a discharge to the parking lot. And so arranging for what is called continuity of follow-up is a real challenge in our world of emergency medicine in an urban center. It might be less so in a suburban center where there is a higher pay type ratio of people that are employed. Rasha, you go ahead. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, we really want to do the best for our patients. And at times you're, you're a little bit limited in the ER and that's just kind of part of the job. I think other things, again, focusing on work-life stuff is you are, it is a 365, 24-7, no weekends, no holidays type of field, not to scare anyone, but realizing that you kind of have to live by your calendar a little bit. Um, you know, your friends may be like, hey, you want to hang out in two weekends? I'm like, uh, let me just, let me just check if I'm off or not. Again, you're able to, the field in general is very flexible. I'm able to kind of dictate my schedule as I want, but I think that's um, another part of it when you're trying to coordinate families calendars and things like that and then another question i think you kind of touched on this but like what personality traits make a good emergency physician or what draw what what traits do, i guess maybe you've seen a lot of physicians in the field that draw the, that drew them in uh, you want to go uh you'll see a common theme is i feel like everyone's like oh they're very add <laughs> I'm not saying that you have to be diagnosed with that at all, but it's a very, it's a very go, 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 go. You have to have a lot of stamina when you're working. Um, again, that's if you're working in a busy ER, you can also work in an urgent care or smaller centers. But overall, it's you're starting with scratch. You're kind of like trying to come up with the diagnosis as fast as you can, as efficient as you can. There's kind of like this ADD kind of personality because you're trying to juggle a lot of things at once. So, Dr. Fowler, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, what was the question, Tyler? It, it was like, what personality traits do you think make a good emergency physician, or what qualities do you think you recognize in a lot of the physicians that work in the hospital around you? 
in emergency medicine, we see every emergency of every gender, of every age group, with every conceivable language at all hours. Um, I think that I think that an emergency physician has to be not discouraged easily. I think that an emergency doc has to be tenacious, uh, you know, really, you know, you grab the bull, you know, whatever you grab, the, the, you know, the dog grabs it with his teeth kind of thing and you don't let it go. I guess the other piece is that for me, and this is just my piece and th those who've been in these sessions, you know, I'm opinionated. Emergency medicine makes you study about everything. Um, I mean, you may be somebody that gets something in your head and you can remember everything, but I'm not. And I have to read all the time. And so <clears throat> I enjoy everything from reading a foot x-ray to a head CAT scan to whatever, to running a difficult differential diagnosis on a patient with tachycardia, for example. And so um, I have a kind of a restless energy toward the diagnostic process in creating a differential diagnosis. And if I don't know it, to look it up and find out or call somebody. I think another part, I'm sorry I talked so long, but another part is humility, which is be honest with what you don't know. You can't send somebody home that gets worse. You have to be careful. That's all. Rashi, go ahead. No, yeah. I agree. And I think that was another touching back on the question of what's challenging that you touched right on that is just always kind of knowing um, and being okay with not knowing. Some people can't do that. They need to know. They want to know the answer and facing a, a, a challenging situation where they may not is not everyone's cup of tea. And then Dr. Katie, as somebody was asking, how do you deal with having to leave your children to go to work? Does it bother you? Do you deal with guilt or how, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Um, no, I love going to work. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm actually now I'm part time. I work about eight shifts a month, which is nice. But like when I'm, I'm ready to go to work when, after having like two, three days with the kids, um, I do have a nanny ultimately like with our schedule being kind of you know sometimes you're a day shift sometimes you're evening sometimes you're night you do need someone to be able to come pick pick the kids up take them to school or whatnot i used to i was like i said earlier i was like oh i'll just drop them off in daycare but you start our shifts at 7 a.m and most daycares aren't open right getting your kids ready getting dropping them off is, isn't always easy um, you know, and then also having a supportive husband right or having a supportive partner that's able to help and understands like okay i'm working a night shift so you're gonna have to take care of them while i'm at work Oh, one of our colleagues, whom you know, but I won't name, uh, has been through like 30 nannies. How did yeah. you finally find a nanny that you trusted? So that's another part is, you know, I talk about your doctor, your mom, but you're also an employer. You're, you're, you know, figuring out taxes for someone, hours, making sure that they're happy because you want them to be happy because they're taking care of your most precious, your precious thing in your life. Um, so word of mouth and literally as soon as I got pregnant, I, that's why I said my, my mother-in-law was like, oh, I have a nanny for you. I was like, what? I didn't even know I needed a nanny. Like, I just thought you could drop them off to a friend's house or my parents' house that don't even live here in the city. Um, but word of mouth is the best thing. Finding other physicians, I think that's the most helpful thing. Other physicians that have nannies, usually once the kids start going to kindergarten, um, they don't need their nanny as much. So those nannies know how doctor's hours works. Um, they understand our needs. And I think that's, that's the secret loss to finding a good nanny. And then one of the last questions I guess I'll touch on, it's a little bit off topic, but it was saying, um, what was your selection process like for narrowing down what, what medical schools you wanted to apply to? How did you know just based off the specialty or just went to everyone? Yeah, I think it's a feel. I really feel it. I, you go through interviews, you go to places, and I can't explain it, but like Jefferson just, just really felt like home to me. Um, I also, I'm in a little bit of a different boat than you guys. I, I went to a combined program, so I did my interviews back in high school. I don't, I don't know, Morchetti, maybe you can, or someone else could talk about that, but. Yeah, Dr. Fowler and I both answered uh, that question in the chat, and uh, okay. we're terrible ones to answer because uh, we only applied to one school each. Uh, yeah. So 
Um, and for me, it was the only medical school in the entire state of Arkansas. I didn't know if y'all knew Arkansas was a state, but it, <laughs> I don't know, everybody forgets about it. Um, and so I already had a couple kids when I applied because I was doing the non-traditional route through school. So I didn't want to uproot my family. Um, and it was risky. I did not get in the first time, uh, but I got in the next year. So, yeah. That's great. <clears throat> All right. Like We're halfway through the f first hour. All so right. um, why should you take it away? Yeah, so we kind of talked a little bit about this in the questions, just about emergency medicine in general. Um, I do I do say this a lot. I don't know if it's the right thing to say or not. I do feel like it's a game. It's like you you start a game you've never played before. Every shift I look at this, it's, you know, how many patients can you see? How fast can you see them? How efficient can you be? And then how good can you be at it while you're doing it, right? You want to provide the best care that you can. So how many bonus points, you know, um, and then there's always hurdles on every shift, um, things that are thrown at you, which you'll see as we um, talk a little bit more about a detailed shift. Um, and then, you know, sorry, let me just go back oh, uh, uh, a little bit. You know, the schedule overall is flexible. Um, you can see schedules can vary. Um, there are like different types of shifts that you can do. Um, and that provides some flexibility in my schedule. I'm like, okay, I want spring break off and I'll group up shifts before or after. So I don't ever have to really kind of take vacation in a way. Um, but I like it because when you're on, you're on. It's hard. I mean, you get your Fitbit steps in when you work a shift. But when you're off, you're off. There's no phone calls. There's no um, referrals that you have to deal with or patients uh, calling you for any med refills or answering services. I'm not getting woken up when I'm sleeping at night. Um, that's, why, that's why I really like it. So a little bit about our schedules in EM. Um, usually they're divided into, there's three different types. You can either do like eight hour shifts, which are like, you can see here, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., like a morning shift, an afternoon shift, and an overnight shift. Or you can do 12 hour shifts, which is a morning and an overnight or like a 24 hour shift, which are usually lower acuity places or like for urgent care centers. Um, usually if you're full time, you work, to, it depends like what type of shift you're doing, but like three to five shifts a week. And then um, understanding like what type of person you are. There are some people that solely do nights. I did solely nights for two years after I had my kids because I just felt like it worked better for me. Um, some people just aren't morning people and they'd rather have an afternoon shift, but the shifts are a little bit different too. Morning shifts, um, are a little bit slower and then get busy. And afternoon shifts, you're starting, they get very busy. You have a lot of after school and work stuff, the car accidents. Um, and night shifts are a little bit different. You have more, um, maybe more of a homeless population or more of the acute stuff in a way uh, that people are actually coming in for in the middle of the night, but it ends, it ends a little bit slower as you empty out the waiting room. Um, and so we were kind of talking about this. It's funny, Dr. Fowler and I, about how you mentally prepare for these shifts. Every shift is a little bit different. Um, your morning shifts, you don't really have time. You kind of get out of bed, grab coffee, listen to a podcast with music on the way, kind of pump yourself up. An afternoon shift, usually when I go in at three, I get to sleep in a little bit, I try to work out, I'll eat breakfast, run some errands, I go to the post office, go to the bank. Um, make sure I eat a big lunch because usually it's really hard to grab dinner during a shift. Um, and then a night shift is different as well. You have to end up taking a nap during the middle of the day so you can go in for that night or you're sleeping during the day. If you work the night before, you're sleeping the next day, wake up, do a little bit before you go in for your shift again at night. Yeah, can I uh, comment about that? Um, being a single guy, no kids, and I very much married medicine 47 years ago and she's a jealous mistress but I keep coming back to her you know I um so when I'm here at my apartment in Dallas uh, it's very different I'm cat catching up on reruns of Law and Order reading a book doing various things uh doing virtual shadowing sessions and all that sort of thing but it's very non-medical so before I go in and Rashi I think knows this about me and some of the working group does I I I, I open the charts and start going through them so that I start really getting into a medical mode, you know, what's going on with this patient, you know, what's in their past history. Uh, what is, if, if there's an interesting lab or x-ray finding or EKG finding, have they had that before? 
And so I, I start getting into that mental mode and then slowly, you know, you scrape your face, you take your shower and you kind of put on the white scrub, scrub thing <clears throat> and you drag yourself toward the hospital. And then as I walk through the door in the ER, I just, I feel this sense of energy and Rashi, I bet you feel it too, that it's a sense of energy and inclusion because we're all there for the same reason in that very big, huge emergency department. And so, um, and then after it's over, I felt this a couple of nights ago when I got off work at two in the morning, you know, I felt we had a very successful, very busy shift. And after I got off, I, I said, you know, I feel really pumped about this. I feel a, a distinct sense of ability, ability that I, that I can do this, you know, and it's a good feeling even, even after four decades of doing this, Rashi. I agree. There's some shifts, you know, it's kind of, some days are the same. And then there's some days you're like, wow, I cannot believe I just did that. I can't believe I just took care of this person. There are times when you literally are saving people's lives. It feels really good to say that. And it's not often that you can say that. And again, taking that step back, there's so many times, like I think back of all the number of people that I've done CPR and saved and sent upstairs. I mean, until you take that time back, Take that, take that step out and be like, wow, this is what I did today. It's that sense of accomplishment and that, that the whole reason we go into medicine. Um, it's nice. Those, those shifts are nice. And I, I always end up picking my phone up and I keep talking to my husband. I can't believe what I did today. Feels great. All right. Um, so, now, Rashi, Rashi let, yeah. let, me, let me open this section for you. Uh, only go to the next slide. Yeah. All right, folks. Now we're going to. So, so much for the family thing, which is exceptionally important. Your, your personal part of you and your life and your family <clears throat> is so important. But now we're going to talk about it. Rashi is going to talk about the work. And what, I, what you're about to see is the mindset of an emergency doc who trained in a four-year program, who is a professor in, in the third most quoted research institution on the planet Earth, which UT Southwestern is. And this is her mindset. She wrote this down. And so the next several slides, I want to very much encourage you to follow how she thinks about what she does. Rashi? Yeah. All right. I, I love writing this. It was kind of nice to put together, but just kind of get in my head here a little bit. Okay. So this is, we're doing an afternoon shift. Okay. We're coming in at three. So you got to sleep in a little bit. You got to eat your big lunch. You packed a meal with you if you want to. You're coming in, you're mentally amped up, um, and the offgoing doc, the 7A to 3P doc, he has to give you the patients that he hasn't completed the workup on. So you get, you're getting sign out. That's what it's called. So you have four patients from the morning doc. Uh, patient one is a 34-year-old male, a guy with appendicitis. Okay, the CT's done. We're waiting to hear from the surgeons what they want to do, what their plan is. Patient two is an old lady. She fell down the stairs, she hurt her head, she has a headache. She's waiting for a CT of her brain and her neck, making sure nothing's broken or there's no bleed in the brain. 55 year old, uh, the patient three is a 55 year old guy. He was in a major car accident. He's waiting for the, um, the trauma team to come back. He's waiting on a whole bunch of x-rays and CAT scans to come back. He's stable. Uh, patient four is a 42 year old female coming in with chest pain. Initial things look okay. It doesn't look like she's having a heart attack, but we're still waiting on blood tests and x-rays to come back. So these are the patients that have already been sitting there. Um, but when you come on, you know, there's a new doc, fresh blood, so there's more patients in the waiting room, right? I said the 3 p.m. shift is really busy. The waiting room's still really full. So we have three patients that are now roomed. Uh, patient five is a 22-year-old male with a headache and a fever. Patient six is a three-year-old. It's a pediatric patient with an earache. And patient seven is an older male with cough and shortness of breath. So, you know, you start these shifts and it looks kind of daunting. This is your board you're looking at. Um, so where do you start, right? And like I said, when you're on, you're on. So having a nice routine of what, what you're gonna do. So as before I even sit down um, and start putting orders in and looking at the screen, I talk to my nurses, the nurses, the techs, I don't want to just like if something happens like this patient seven right this old guy with shortness of breath it's worrisome i'm not going to all of a sudden scream at my nurses what do you do you want to you want to call people by their names you want to introduce themselves they should know who you are um and um so they can help you you have a, your whole shift ahead of you so it's really important to do that and then um you also make sure you have all your equipment on you right i usually 
we don't do that here as much because we have such a big hospital that's done for us, but some places you do need to make sure your, your emergency carts are stocked, um, you have like meds that you may need if an emergency were to happen. Okay, so that's done. So now I have three patients waiting for me. So things that are helpful to see, who do you see first, right? Everyone's like, oh, first come, first serve, right? We all know that's not true, right? There's reasons that people get seen first. So you look at your vitals. That's in front of you. That's already done in triage. So here you can see patient five, his vitals, the 22-year-old with the headache and fever. He has a high heart rate. The usual heart rate should be less than 100. His breathing is a little bit fast. It should be from anywhere to 12 to 18. Um, he does have a fever of 104, but he's, um, his oxygen saturation looks okay. Patient six is a three-year-old. Um, his vitals for a three-year-old is actually normal. Right? That's something that you need to know. Even though his respiratory rate is kind of fast for an adult, it's actually normal for a kid. Same with the heart rate. Patient seven, his heart rate's a little bit fast, 108, not as fast as patient five. He's breathing pretty fast. He doesn't have a temp, uh, but his oxygen level is 82%. That's really worrisome, especially since he's coming in with shortness of breath. I'm going to go see him first. Okay. Um, Oh, oops, sorry, I forgot I wrote this slide. Here we go, this is kind of the thought process. Patient seven is the most concerning. Is he breathing okay? Does he need oxygen? Do I need to intervene? That's kind of my thoughts. Um, so step one, I introduce myself. Step two, I'm gonna go see patient seven. I find out that he has COPD uh, from a long smoking history. So I wanna start him on NEBS, get an IV, get chest x-ray, put him on oxygen. I'm gonna call RT, uh, respiratory text, to come and start him on his nebulizer treatment. So while I've kind of stabilized him, I'm gonna go see patient five and six, the 22-year-old with the headache and fever, and the three-year-old with the earache. Okay, I've seen them. I have to come back to the computer to get orders put in. Um, I'm gonna order a CAT scan for this guy with the headache, um, and then I'll probably just sit there, you know, it's one of those things, you do have to wait there. The three-year-old's probably good to go. He has otitis media or an ear infection, but I have to do these other things first. Like get this EKG. Right, number five, you're gonna, one of the things in emergency medicine is, like I said, there's always hurdles, you gotta jump in this game. You, we're constantly looking at EKGs. Any patient that walks in with chest pain in the waiting room gets an EKG within 10 minutes, I believe what it is, um, and you have to make sure they're not having a heart attack. So EKG comes, looks okay, stand it back. Meanwhile, while I sign the EKG, patient one, the guy with the appendicitis, is asking if he can eat, right? No, you can't eat, you may have to go to surgery, sorry. Then patient three's family calls. Hey, can you tell us what's going on? Sorry, patient three was the uh, car accident, the trauma guy. Um, I'm waiting for the trauma team to let me know what we're gonna do, okay? Okay, meanwhile, another patient comes in, patient eight. This is a 53-year-old male um, on blood thinners coming in with a nosebleed. Basic rule of emergency medicine, stop the bleed. Someone's bleeding, you gotta stop the bleed. Go to his room, tell him to pinch his nose, don't let go. Tell his family member, you do not let go, put a timer on 20 minutes, I'll be back. Meanwhile, surgery calls me, tells me that they're gonna take patient one to the OR for his appendicitis. Um, patient two's imaging comes back, the old lady that fell and um, has a headache, or it looks like she doesn't have a brain bleed, doesn't look like she has a fracture in her neck, so she's good to go, but she's an old lady and she's there by herself and she fell. So I have to call social work, make sure that she is safe to go home. Does she have a safe home to go to? Does she have family that lives with her? Um, it's not, you know, these sign outs aren't just as easy as, oh, let's wait for the, wait for the imaging, that's okay, she can go. You always wanna make sure that they're going as safely as possible home. Rashi, that point is so important because for those of you who end up taking care of a lot of old folks, and some of you on this call will, um, the biggest chance that, an older person that would be older than me and Morchetti um, will end up having a problem at home is that they'll fall. If a 90 year old falls, breaks her hip, she'll catch pneumonia, she'll die. And so you have to make sure that the patient can conduct their activities of daily living. That's called ADLs. Uh, and that falls to you to do that. Look at all these patients in here and Rashi in the meantime has to figure out that this old lady can go home and her environment will be secure enough that she can be at home, Rashi. Yep, exactly. In the meantime, we have a new patient coming in, patient number nine. He's a 37-year-old male.
who is screaming. He's really upset. He had to wait a long time in the waiting room and all he wants is blood pressure medicine refills. That's why he's there and he wants it now and he's threatening to call administration if he doesn't get seen right away. While you're kind of hearing this commotion go on, you get another EKG in front of you. Shit, this is a STEMI. Excuse my language, but that's what goes on through my head. Shit, this is a STEMI. Um, this, that means like a heart attack. This is like what you see on TV. They need to go to the cath lab fast. So I'm gonna call code STEMI. That activates the cath team. So the cardiologist, if, it's, if he's at home or wherever he is, gets to the cath lab, gets the nurses up in the cath lab. Um, in the meantime, I still have to get IVs on him, start him on meds, get a chest x-ray, get him on transport monitors, make sure I have a dedicated nurse that will take him up to the cath lab. Okay, and now I'm dealing with that while patient nine is still yelling about having to wait for me to get his med medication refills. Okay. Now, I have a three-year-old that's here, and I don't want them witnessing this potentially violent patient, right? Um, this could be a psych patient in general. I don't know. I don't know what this guy is going to do. I want that three-year-old out of here. That's, I don't want them witnessing this. So I'm going to discharge a three-year-old. And meanwhile, I'm in front of my computer, you know, I'm working on his paperwork to discharge him. Since I'm in front of a computer, I want to be as efficient as, efficient as possible. I'm going to go through patient four's labs. That was the, the lady with the chest pain um, that was signed out to me. They all look normal. I'm going to go tell her. I try to get as many people out as I can in this moment, right? So I'm going to tell her, reassure her, right? She's in the emergency room because she's really worried she's having a heart attack. It's really easy to just be like, hey, you're fine. But um, I, I feel like I went to emergency medicine to help not just say you're fine, but reassure them. Like they want, she wants to know if she's having a heart attack. Just saying you're fine, your labs and stuff looks okay. It's okay, but that's not, that's not the beauty of what we do. So going through and telling her, we got a chest x-ray, we got EKG, we did multiple labs and look for a blood clot in your heart. If you're anemic, if you have electrolyte problems, everything looks okay, but you still need to go to your doctor, right? This is, all, this is your chance to intervene too, this lady, could have something down the line explaining to her that what I do is just making sure you don't have a heart attack right now, but there's stuff to take after this. It's hard to do when you have people yelling and like threatening to call administration on you, right? Okay, so now we get a call from radiology that patient three, he was the 55 year old guy with the car accident. Um, he has a bleed in his brain on the CAT scan. So, okay, so I'm like maybe three hours into my shift. I haven't even gone back to see this guy. He was signed out to me. I haven't heard anything. All I know is he could be somnolent, you know, her needing his brains out. So go back, check on him. Hey, are you okay, sir? Yeah, inform him what a brain bleed means, what the steps are, what the steps are, right? That's a scary thing to just tell someone. Um, so I talked to him about it, consult neurosurg, start treatments if I need to, and I admit him to the trauma service. Now, the nurse comes to me and tells me, hey, patient seven, that first patient that we saw on our shift, he's, he's looking kind of worse. Do you mind coming and looking at him? That's another red flag. If a nurse ever asks you, can you look at someone, you go. Right? The nurses are great. They have great clinical acumen. If they believe something's up, there's something's up. I go, I look at him. He's really working to breathe. His COPD is just... Um, it's getting worse. The nebs didn't help him. The nebulizers didn't help him. So I'm going to start him on a BiPAP machine to help breathe air into him. And I'm going to tell the nurses to get the intubation stuff ready. Okay. So in the meantime, while they're making sure IVs are in, getting meds to do an intubation, getting all that stuff ready, um, the patient ate, the patient with the nosebleed, and he's like, oh, 20 minutes of pressure actually helped. Can I go? Yes, please. <laughs> um, you'll be fine. Just follow up with your doctor. Meanwhile, again, EKG, patient in the waiting room to see um, feeling palpitations. Sure enough, he has AFib, that's an irregular heartbeat. Um, so I'm gonna ask them, instead of keeping him in the waiting room, telling the nurse, bring him into a room, put him on a monitor, get an IV in and I'll be in to see him. Okay, so in the meantime, now I know I have another patient that's potentially, potential to decompensate. I'm gonna go intubate patient seven, and just admit him to the MICU, okay? It sounds really easy just to do that, but there's a lot of steps involved with that. So I'm gonna admit him to the MICU. Um, Rashi, uh, to, to comment, please notice, I mean, look at number 19, folks. 
she said she input information, she processed, and she did a temporary disposition. Input information, get the EKG from the waiting room, uh, determined it was atrial fibrillation, and then processed it and made a, a disposition, put them in a room on a monitor, and I'm sure you would say, and by the way, draw labs and stick an IV in them, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're making all of these decisions at once, like recognizing this is AFib, right? EKG comes in front of you. The number of EKGs you get on a shift, being able to identify which one is important enough to act on. Important. At the same time, you don't want to bring things that aren't important, right? Then you have more people that are in their ER that's going to potentially disrupt your thought process to get through your shift. Okay, so we've intubated a patient. Feel great about that whenever you can do a successful intubation. Um, Remember patient five, I'm at the computer now, right? Just putting in my notes for this patient. I see patient five's CAT scan is normal. He was the young guy with a headache and a fever. Even though he gave him meds, he still has a fever. So at this point, I'm worried about meningitis, which is an infection of the brain. So I'm gonna start him on antibiotics, put him in isolation, and um, tell the nurses to get the spinal tap ready, um, have the tray ready. So um, in the meantime, Mickey takes the patient upstairs. And I say that's important to know that a patient goes upstairs because one of my nurses is going to be gone when they're upstairs. So recognizing my staffing at that time as well. It's one of the things we do as an ER doc. Now, right now, things are kind of stable. Um, I, I know I have my, in the back of my mind, I know that, like I have this AFib patient that's potentially unstable. I know that he's okay because he's able to walk, so that's okay. And I know I have another procedure to do. I have to do a spinal tap on someone. So these things are in the back of my, my mind. Um, but I go and see patient nine, uh, talk to him. Sometimes I do have to be a little bit stern. Um, some, some of my residents are amazed, that they like, you look so little, you know, you look so calm. But these are, these are the moments when you're like, you have to educate patients about proper ED utilization. Because you know what, sometimes they've just never been taught that. Um, and also about getting med refills through the ER. And that's okay. Ultimately though, I tell everyone that we're here for you, um, but you know, threatening to call administration stuff for something like this may, may not always be your best interest. Anyway, um, so in the meantime, I have a new patient, patient 11, who is, oh, I can't see, 38 year old male, oh yeah, with a dislocated ankle. Um, he was playing soccer and he has a dislocated ankle and the nurse tells me he has a lot of pain and to go see the patient. Again, the nurse is telling me this, I'm going to go see this patient. The foot is blue. It doesn't have a pulse. It's swollen. So it's, you know, again, it's really easy to like not see these patients, right? Just like, okay, I'll order an x-ray. You look at this, that's an emergency. That's a dislocated foot with a vascular compromise. That means that the foot isn't getting blood. That's something that you're not just going to put in a splint. That's something that you need to put back into place immediately. And I will do that. You will do that. In a I've done that in a hallway before. I'm literally, he has not, he's not even been in the room yet. I will yank on that foot to make sure that it's back in place and it has a pulse before I go anywhere else. Because I don't want this young guy's foot to die. Um, so I'll pull it back, feel that snap, call x-ray, confirm it's in, and then we'll, and then we'll deal with that. Now I can go see the AFib patient. This is patient 10. He, he's now on a monitor. His heart rate's in the 180s. His blood pressure's now dropping. So um, he's already on defibrillator pads. Um, he should have had an IV. I'm going to give him meds, and I'm going to shock him to get out of this. When their blood pressure's dropping or their mental status is changing, that's something that, that's an urgent sign that needs to be taken care of. Um, I'll call cardiology um, to get him up into the ICU. Okay, so it's the end of my shift. Um, the overnight doc comes in and there's like that moment sometimes when you're like when running, running, running and the, the next doc coming in to relieve you. It's just this, thank God you're here. I'm so happy to see you. So he comes in to get sign out. So at this point, I have three patients who are still there. Um, patient five was the young man with a headache and a fever. Patient 10 was the AFib guy who I just shocked. I just did it, right? So he hasn't actually gone upstairs yet. And then patient 11, the guy with the ankle dislocation that I pulled and put in place who's waiting for an x-ray. So I'm gonna, like all these patients are probably gonna still be here for this doc. So I'm, I'm telling him about these patients, but I don't wanna leave a procedure for a doctor to do who he doesn't know. I have rapport with the patient. The patient knows me, I've discussed this with them. So I'm gonna be the one to want to do the spinal tap. So 
because sometimes you do have to stay a little bit late on your shift. So I do a spinal tap, admit them to medicine. Um, and then again, since I'm in front of a computer, I'm gonna look at the ankle x-rays. Also, that's my own, I just wanna know, you know, did he have a fracture? What was it? Did I get it back in place? You can look at his x-rays. It looks like he has a fracture. I can put it in a splint and then consult ortho. And then I'm gonna go home and feel like I did a great day and save some lives. So Rashi, there's no way you can keep all that in your mind at one time, can you? I mean, is there really such a thing as parallel processing where you actually have all of this going on at once and you're thinking, you're thinking about all of these individual patients all the, all the time? Does that really happen? You know, I think that's such a big part of our field. We hear this a lot. You know, we, everyone feels like they can do multiple things at once, right? Like you can shop and look at Facebook at the same time, right? But really, I feel like to do a really good job in here, it's not. I think you're, you'll notice like all these moments, I'll take a step back, process patient eight. Did everything look okay? Okay. And then that patient nine. So I think there's still step wise to do this. It's not, you can't do everything at once. There's only one of you, one of you, one brain, two hands, but ultimately um, it's just you and your thought process. The reason I brought that up and I'd be interested to get Brandon's comments also that it's in the old days, 40 years ago, um, it was said, well, we need to be doing parallel processing. We're doing all this at once and we're thinking about all of them simultaneously. And that's actually not true. Uh, uh, it's, it's sequential processing. You think about one, then you think about another, then you think about another, then you think about another. If it's one that's more dangerous and complicated, you may think about them several times, but we actually don't process all of them simultaneously. What steps do you do, Rashi? And Brandon, I would also ask you, what steps do you do? And actually, I saw one of your notes, Brandon, uh, to try to keep all these patients straight at the same time. I mean, you've, you've got 15 people there all at the same time and some of them quite sick. How do you keep all that straight? Yeah. Um... Sadly, you know, I, ultimately it, it is this. It's like, oh, the three-year-old kid or, oh, the guy with the orange jacket. Like you kind of have to do that. It's not, I wouldn't say it's dehumanizing a patient, but you're kind of having to put things into context a little bit. Like, oh, the guy with the stinky feet, right? Oh, the guy with the maggots on his leg. Like these little things that you do to kind of keep yourself in order. But everyone has a different way. Um, some people... Some people keep lists, you'll see that. You'll see people keep a list and then they'll cross off all the patients that they're done seeing or they'll put boxes of all the things that has to be done. Um, everyone kind of approaches it differently. I think the most important thing is having your team be on the same page. Every time I do something, I put orders in, I let my nurses know. That way things just flow a lot smoother and they can tell me, be like, hey, let me know when the CAT scan's back while I go intubate this guy. And that way I have someone else that's kind of doing my thinking for me in a way because parallel processing is hard. You can't really do it. So we've gotten uh, one good question. Uh, so what if something goes wrong and somebody gets worse or you lose them? How do you handle that? Yeah. Um, I mean, every now and then these things surprise you. It comes out of the blue. Um, sometimes maybe a medicine, a wrong medicine was given, or you totally, you know, I thought this was COPD and it actually ended up being like a huge blood clot in their lungs. Um, and that's a part of the game of emergency medicine is knowing how to act, um, not getting scared, know, knowing when to take that step back, taking that deep breath, and then keep moving, keep moving forward and taking action. Um, Things, sometimes things do go south and it's, it's totally unexpected. But again, if you keep prepared and your team, your, your, your team is all on board, you kind of prevent these things from happening when you, when you, once you become more seasoned and skilled at it. All right. So what do you do if, a, if, especially when you're busy, you've got 19 patients in there, some of them quite sick, and then you'll have, a, and you've got a plan for a patient, but the consultant disagrees with you. And especially when it's, you want to put them in and they said, send them home. How do you yeah. deal with a disagreement? Again, um, I, I'll listen to them. I'll ask them, like, what, what is it that 
you think that they can go home for. And I'll give them my side of it as well. But I'll consider, you know, sometimes they have a different focus, right? I'm very emergency medicine focused and the orthopedic surgeon may be like, it's an open finger fracture. We don't really care about that. That can go home with antibiotics. So sometimes they may be right. And taking that time to understanding their perspective, recognizing their perspective, but ultimately you're the one that's there with the patient, right? This patient doesn't have a house to go to. This, this patient can't afford the medicine. It's not gonna be able to pick up antibiotics. Relaying that to the consultant is the best thing you can do. Ultimately, you're there for the patient, right? You're, you want the best for the patient. Um, and you can, you're the one that can be their best advocate, even though if the consultant is on the phone at their house or upstairs. You know, I, uh, uh, I've gotten more and more careful with the passing years. And, I, and to the folks on the, uh, on the session, uh, go to my website, rayfowler.com, and go to the lectures section and pull up Fowler's 15 Laws of Safe Emergency Medicine. One of them is, it isn't what it isn't. That is what you've already ruled out. It's what it might be, something that you haven't ruled out that will get the patient in trouble and get you in trouble. You always have to advocate for the patient. I think what's, what the passing years have done for me, especially getting the blue hair here, is that, um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, finishing the point. The young folk, you know, I'm often dealing with a resident who's saying send them home, that's, and he's less than half my age, and he's never seen anybody die yet. He's never treated a patient, was wrong, and the patient, or just the patient got worse and died. And so, you know, sometimes they're, I just feel that the consultants, especially in my world where there are a lot of young kids, are, may not be quite as careful. And so we can always escalate it up the food chain. You go from the intern to the resident, to the senior resident, to the attending if need be. That's, that's all I've got. Yeah. There's always hiccups along the way. And that's why I feel like every shift is like a game. All right. Um, so um, back, to the, back to the blue hair here. Um, yeah. I like emergency medicine because uh, I like different subjects. I like not taking care of the same thing all the time. There are days when it seems like half the patients in my ER are people drinking themselves to death and the other half are suicidal. Uh, and the other half waiting to come in are heroin addicts who are there because they have abscesses in their arms and they're rotting out a heart valve because, and and I get so frustrated sometimes because I, I just can't help certain people. We've talked about medicine, what, three weeks ago, that it is a partnership in health with the patient. You learn an applied science to develop a partnership in healthcare. And I find it very frustrating sometimes that having that partnership can be darn hard to do. Um, and because the patient has to pick up part of it as well. Only the drunk can keep that bottle out of his mouth, for example. Um, so. Things that can be hard to deal with are social situations. Uh, we are a very, very busy hospital at Parkland. There are times we're full, and there just simply isn't a place to put patients, uh, as, in, as in patients. And so we're, we're having to triage who is the least sick that we can try to send home. What are the pros of emergency medicine? It's fast moving. Um, I love the people I work with, and that's present company included. Um, you know, I, I work with the best friends of my life, with that, and I think Rashi and Brandon probably feel the same way. A lot of just really terrific people, you know, who really care about people. They're so smart. They work so hard. And they honestly care about you. And that kind of interchange um, is hard to find in the private sector. It's harder to find. And uh, I did 20, I did the first half of my career in the privates, and now the second half of my career in academics. And I far, far, far prefer uh, an academic career. Um, so you know, the potential, the reality of all this is the fact that you're fairly much on your own, but at least if there's something you don't know and there's a chance the patient won't do well, get the answer, find it out. Keep working your way up the telephone food chain until such time as you get the answer that you need. How not to get emotionally attached. When I was a lot younger, I really found that I did get emotionally attached. And I've got stories on my website. Uh, go read the story at rayfowler.com on Amazing Grace. Uh, that, that'll be a reading assignment for next time for all of you on the call. Um, and it was the story of a 
of a, a gal who was dying of cancer in my room and we stood around her and we sang Amazing Grace to her while she died. And there are several stories like that. And it's really hard not to get emotionally attached. I think with the passing of time, you know, you get your own maturity, you know, you get your own security in your own life and your feelings about things. And so you know how to measure your feelings and not react so much. That's the difference between me and a kid is that I don't react anywhere near as much emotionally and irrationally, maybe irrationally, but uh, acutely as I used to. What kind of people? All types. What kind of behavior? You name it. And how it depends on an academic hospital or private practice. I think I just mentioned that, you know, that I especially love the academic intellectual friendships that I've formed with the people with whom I work. Um, and that brings me pleasure every day. Rashi? Yeah, I think um, kind of like you touched on, when you do deal, deal with these difficult situations, is talking about it. And it's been nice in this academic sphere because we have the ability to talk about it, whether it's writing it on a website, giving a lecture about it, or teaching future residents about, you know, things that I had experienced that I don't want them to experience. Just by sharing those things kind of prevents it from staying inside of you. It makes you kind of able to react to it in a way that's, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but the, to rise above it, basically, so you don't get burnt out down the line. So okay. um, let me go back and reintroduce Taylor, who is our host this evening. Taylor, um, um, her uncle was a resident um, at um, our residency program. Uh, Brandon, you may not have known, but Poochie was her uncle. Uh, all covered with tattoos, a beautiful man, and uh, uh, he introduced Taylor to me and some of the other faculty at Southwestern, and lo and behold, there she was hanging out in Parkland AR. And Taylor, what did you see in Parkland? Um, I mean, I guess it was, my, it was my first time experiencing any form of shadowing, so I was kind of like nervous, and I didn't really know what to expect, because like at at that point, I thought, oh, like, I want to do, like, psychiatry, but I hadn't, I didn't know anything about it, really, to say for sure, and I didn't really know how I would feel about the procedural aspect, or physiologically, how it would make me feel. I was kind of nervous about the way my body would react, like, can I handle this? Like, will I even like this? What am I, what am I doing this summer? And so I was a little apprehensive, but once I got in there, I just started to see just such a wide range of patients you can see, and I just was blown away, and just how well that they could just, like, figure it out and move on and I don't know I just it, it it just astonished me and like something that I really enjoyed was like the patient interaction like I really didn't know if I would enjoy being around people or like if I could watch like if I could see blood or whatever but I ended up like really liking it and being so much more interested than I thought I would and it opened my eyes just like being able to experience something new and I still don't even know what else I'd what else I'd like because I haven't seen anything else but I loved it and I took all the time that I could to spend every every minute I could there and I, I got the most out of it but I was able to see things from common sicknesses to car accidents everything in between and to me I just I don't know you always think of like the tv shows and everything you hear about emergency medicine like untold stories of the ER and whatnot but it's kind of like that and I liked it. It was fast paced and I liked the patient interaction and it just so, really opened my eyes. So Taylor, you got to sort of hang out with several different docs. Yeah. Any comments about the different personalities that you observed among physicians? For sure. Or, I mean, or, or were they all or were they all absolutely identical? No, no one was the same, but to be completely honest, every person I encountered, I really did enjoy them. Like I didn't, I thought maybe some people would be snobby or a little like, more stuck up or I didn't want to like ask too many questions or annoy them. But a lot of people were really open to me asking questions. You just got to know when, but also kind of digress. But I don't know. Some people were more open. Like I, I could see how they all were participating in the same field, but different at the same time. Some were more like knowledgeable, like very straightforward and others were more like, well, maybe like more just relax. And I liked getting to see that you don't have to be one specific way that you can have different type of personalities and all run around in the same field. So I like that too. Well, cool. Rashi, take it away. Um, okay. So this is kind of dialing back a little bit, you know, I just did like this Kate, like, I really just feel like I just went to work talking to you guys <laughs> about that. Just 
an eight hour shift in 30 minutes. Um, but I thought, I think about this because actually Ray, uh, Dr. Fowler and I, we both wear white coats. There aren't many people that do wear white coats. And I brought this up as I think we wear white coats for different reasons. Um, uh, I wear a white coat because it's cold in that ER. Um, I'm an old man. Uh, I keep my stethoscope in my right pocket and I keep my uh, EKG calipers as Brandon Morchetti does in my left pocket along with my trauma shears. And I keep my otoscope in the top pocket. I have a pen here and I have the tongue blades and uh, cotton tip applicators that you can never find, and KY jelly that you can never find when you want them in another pocket as well. Why do you wear a white coat? Yeah, exactly. My white coat can hold my name tag up and it makes me look like I'm a doctor, right? The number of times when I'm not wearing a coat or I get confused as for a nurse, um, it's not that it's infuriating. I get it. People are in, they're kind of in a state of bewilderment. They don't understand what's going on, but I want, I want them to feel comfortable knowing that, the, that they're getting the care that they want. I ultimately have to do it for the patient. I, you, at first I thought it was for me. I remember I had a female mentor who told me that you, you kind of have to look the part of a doctor. Not only since I am a, a minority, but also as a female, I'm a small female, it's something that you have to look nice. I have to have my hair done. I can't just roll out of bed, have my makeup done, earrings on. It's just, unfortunately, it's kind of a part of it. And at first I thought, I was so mad by that. Every, all the time, patients will be like, how old are you? Are you old enough to be a doctor? Are you old enough to be a doctor? I'm like, yes, yes, I can take care of you. I clear, like, I feel like I could do almost a better job than some other people may. Um, and I don't, want, I don't want them to ever feel like that in the back of their head when I'm trying to take care of them in one of their most vulnerable aspects of their life. Um, so that's why I end up wearing a white coat. And you never know what type of patient you're gonna get. Some people are very nice and some people aren't. Um, and some people, you know, they're just trying to do the best thing for their family member who may be dying. And I just, I don't want that to be in the back of their mind. Um, I think, I think one of the things you'll find in common, I was never a coffee drinker, but man, I, I drink multiple cups of coffee now <laughs> a day, and I think most of us do. Um, but mentally preparing yourself before a shift is kind of different as well. Um, and it's something I think we all ultimately do in our own ways, um, but everyone does it differently. I definitely, it's, it's coffee and sometimes it's, a prep, it's prepping yourself. Like I'm gonna be working uh, a critical care shift on Thursday. And I'm kind of already, like knowing that COVID is going on, preparing myself about how I'm gonna do this situation by myself um, when all this is going on. Because I wanna, when I'm on, I wanna be on, the, on my game, at the top of my game. Rashi, do you mind going back to that previous slide? Um, um, so what do you do with the occasionally rude or, I mean, do patients always tell you the truth always or, is, or um, for example, uh, there, I have a phrase called times three and times three is whatever people admit to drinking alcohol times three, whatever they actually admit to. That's actually been published. There was a study that looked at that, that used what's called collateral information from, you know, family and so on and determined that in fact about people admit to about 40% of the amount that they drink when they drink heavily. Yeah. Um, but how do you deal with folks, especially in the ones where, you know, honesty, for example, uh, folks who come in because they're having a pain problem and you go to the prescription monitoring program for the state of Texas, which is now part of our medical record, and you find out that they have been to some physician somewhere every single week and have gotten 60 pills a week for the last two years. And the reason it's two years is that you can't see any further back than that. Yeah. And they're coming in because, no, I'm not on any medicine, and they're having a severe pain complaint. How do you deal with it? Yeah. I feel like out of all the patients that we see, I will take care of a homeless people, our patient population. I have scraped maggots off of legs before. I have pulled fingers out of gloves. I can do those, but I actually think that the drug seekers are probably the most difficult patients <laughs> that we take care of. Um, again, it's understanding. I think over time you kind of understand um, people's personality traits and how to approach them differently. Um, so understanding this person's personality and where they're coming from is something you do kind of behind the scenes. 
And then you know, well, some patients, I just have to be really upfront and I have to be bossy and that comes out of me at times. And other times I'll actually sit down and make them, make sure they feel like they're heard. Sometimes that's all they need is they need to be heard. Um, but I'm not going to give in, right? I do feel like we have to protect our specialty and our ER. I'm not going to like, oh, I'll just give them meds. No one's going to find out. And then they keep coming back over and over again. But again, understanding your patient, I think is the number one thing that you have to do. And then sometimes you do though. Sometimes you do have to call the cops and you're going to have to pull these patients out and be like, we can't help you in this situation. You're not dying. You're going to have to go. But it's hard. It's really hard when you want, like we go into this field to help people. That's what you want to do. And in those moments, sometimes you don't really feel like you're, you're helping them. All right. or they may not realize that you're helping them, but you are. <laughs> Another phrase I use about that when someone comes in, like I described, who's been on a host of pain medications and they come in because they're having horrible, horrible pain. And you know, they've gotten oodles, thousands of pills, literally not exaggerating. And, we, and we've all seen these. You really have to ask yourself, what is the real emergency? Yeah. And is it actually a narcotic withdrawal problem? And dealing with these kinds of things can be exceptionally difficult because often it doesn't seem like they want help. But sometimes when you can just at least start that little spark, let them know that you're aware <clears throat> that um, you want to help, that my assessment is that this is an issue that they need to deal with because it's not going to get better and they need to deal with it. Yeah. Thank you, Rush. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then yeah, you know, again, like kind of looping back, like I was thinking of, of you guys and how I was in your shoes. I'm like, oh, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a doctor. And I'm like, here I am, I am I'm a doctor. Am I, am I grown up now? I think that just sounds crazy to say, and I'm not. I have a whole, I still have so much more in my life that I didn't even realize. Um, so learning to become a whole person in general, right? This is kind of all about being a physician, but there's life outside of this, right? Raising my kids, how, what kind of mom do I wanna be? How involved do I wanna be with them? Like. When am I going to start getting serious about my guitar playing, right? Um, reading, connecting with friends, like learning how to become a whole person. Um, it, it, it never ends. It's always going to be there. And then, you know, staying on top of my game. EM is a field where you can't just do the same thing day in and day out. It's always going to be challenges, differences, and staying on top of that as well. So, again, taking that step back to look at yourself, be introspective. Um, of who you are and what you want. So you don't get bogged down into this, into this realm of things and you don't get burnt out eventually. Do you think teaching a subject that you know helps you remember it? Oh, yeah. I, I you know, you know me. I love teaching. I, lo I, I have put together a curriculum um, and I have give lectures every month to the residents. And I think that that's what keeps me on my game as well because there's kind of this, this, you feel obligated, right? If I'm gonna give a lecture, it's down on my schedule, I better know that stuff really well. Uh, to the group, uh, Rashi has just come off several years of doing case presentations to the residency to help the kids in training uh, see where things might have gone better or differently, uh, how a decision-making process perhaps didn't lead to an answer that was the optimal answer. And uh, Rashi did many, many presentations for our residency over the years, for which we're very grateful. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's a great way. Was, you know, the other thing is, it's nice when you're in med school and residency, you have someone else that's looking over your shoulders. You know you're doing the right thing. But eventually later in life, like, I never, I never see what Ray does. I don't know what he does. I don't, I don't hear about how I am. No one really critiques me about the type of doctor I am or what I've done. Um, and so that's why I do teaching. It's my way of making sure that I'm being the best doctor that I can be. Um, and I love, and I love doing that. Again, I had to realize that that was a passion of mine to get there. Any thoughts? Well, we questions we've, we've got an hour and 20 minutes and we want to take questions now. Um, um, and what I'd love to do is throw it open for as long as the group and as long, Rashi, as you feel like you have time um, uh, to uh, just uh, take questions uh, to the group, put them in chat or, uh, Taylor, do you have some you pulled off? Um, 
Oh yeah, we have about 10 million. I don't think we could even get close to answering all of them. Uh, a lot of them are PA questions too. I don't know if you could answer those about like the difference in maybe a PA in the ER versus a physician. Some of those uh, came up a lot. Yeah. Um, Brandon Morchetti has been awfully quiet tonight, which makes me nervous. It, it, it often makes me think that he's plotting something. Uh, are you on permanent mute, or do you want to take that question about the role of a PA in the ER, Brandon? No, no, I'm happy to. I'm I'm typing away getting carpal tunnel here. Uh, so, yeah, happy to. Um, for uh, PAs and NPs, uh, it depends on what hospital you work in. They can be utilized in different ways. Um, we have two hospitals that we're credentialed at that use our advanced practice providers. So at Parkland, for example, our PAs and NPs are mostly relegated up to the front. They do a lot of medical screening evaluations and urgent care type things, uh, a lot of lower acuity things that you can um, kind of treat and street is the, is the mantra. Um, a lot of uh, simple procedures and things like that. Um, at other, the other hospital that I'm credentialed to work at, uh, they take a much more active role and it's kind of a free for all. They can pick up uh, critical patients, they can uh, do intubations and do uh, uh, central lines, big, big IVs and neck veins. Um, you know, they can manage sick patients and admit them to the ICU and they're very good and very independent and have great autonomy. And we're there just as a, kind of a soundboard if they have questions. If they, uh, you know, want to talk about the differential, if they have, uh, want to know what's the best workup to do, uh, we're there just as a soundboard. So rarely do they need us, but when they come to me with the question, uh, I, I work with them a lot. I know them, I trust them. So if they come to me with a question, I know it's something that deserves my full attention and I give it to them. Uh, uh, we have a great working relationship with them. Wherever, uh, for those of you who are pre-PA, um, that's a very important question for you to ask wherever you go work, um, you know, depending on what you want to do with your uh, PA license, you want to make sure that you're in an environment that supports that and that you're surrounded by people that will support you. I, um, I love our, the term is mid-level. I don't like the term mid-level, so please forgive me using it. Uh, but I'll use it this one last time, mid-level practitioners at Parkland. I love them. We have, a gr we have a great group, and the thing that, as I've said now many times in these talks, it is aptitude and the willingness to work, and you've got to have both. You've got to have some smarts, but then the work ethic has to be there, which means if you don't know it, look it up, and if you will do that in a career, you will be astonished how good you get at, in the practice of medicine. So uh, we consider our mid-levels, again, forgive that term, we, we consider them our partners in healthcare, and we share very interesting cases uh, all the time. And so, um, and it, it, uh, just to finish uh, or restate Brandon's thought, it will depend on where you get hired on as far as what you end up um, uh, being allowed to do. Uh, one of the smartest people I ever met was a PA for thoracic surgery, cardiothoracic, at St. Joseph Hospital in Atlanta 40 years ago. We taught the ACLS program together for years. Um, and this guy took care of the sickest people in the world, you know, starting their lines, doing their intubations, managing their um, pharmacodynamics during surgery and so forth, you know. So you can be as good as you want to be. You just have to have a lifetime of study to do that. Rasha, any comments about our PAs and NPs? Yeah, again, um, they're all brilliant. They all do a great job of staying on top of it. I think I can't give you the greatest insight onto their career path or getting there. Um, I didn't. I missed the initial question, though. But I don't. I don't. I, I can't talk about them getting there. I don't have problems with them. But so a part of it, you know, I, I thought that too. I kind of look back because I feel like when I did when I was getting into medical school a long time ago, there wasn't really that option. So I didn't explore that as much. But I do like having my own kind of independence and the kind of that job security, knowing that I will have a job. Um, Rashi, there's a question here on the topic of gender in the workplace. Um, uh, were there any times that you felt like gender discrimination by patients affected your interaction with them? You know, to be honest, I think I get more of um, the young age. I think the more is more about me looking young than it is about my gender. Um, and the gender stuff, it's more like being confused as, as a nurse. 
than as a doctor. Um, and yeah, is, every now and then there is like an older male patient that will like, I, I want to do it. I want to do doctor. And I kind of face them. I just tell them, hey, you know what? You waited in the waiting room for me. I am your doctor. And I'm just upfront with it. I'm your doctor. If I'm here. I'm happy to help you. In this moment, I'm happy to help you with what you need, what your questions are. Again, getting to that patient's level and what their understanding is. And if you want to see a male doctor, you're just going to have to go back into the waiting room. That's just how it is. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Taylor, another question. Um, another question is, how do you treat someone who can't pay or is saying that they can't pay? What, how do you go about treating them just as effectively? Let yeah. me take that one. I'll, I'll start that one. Uh, the, I worked for 20 years for a private hospital corporation uh, in Georgia, which is a large, and it, which is still around the private hospital corporation, uh, which was very much about ability to pay for the second half of my career, for 20 years, uh, I've been at a large urban trauma facility that is county funded. And I'll tell you, we don't think much about what stuff costs there. Do y'all, do you, Rashi, do you think much about what things cost? Not at all. That's or the brain. nice thing where we work. You know, uh, an MRI, MRI scan is $5,000 or whatever it is. But, you know, there's cost and there's charge, you know, and you know, a hospital will charge you a thousand dollars for the first IV bag and call it IV therapy. This is true. Or that simple electrolyte panel, uh, they'll charge a thousand dollars for seven tests. Uh, what does it cost them? About a dollar seventy-five, plus the blood drawing and the staff to do it and stuff. So, I just really kind of quit worrying about cost. And one last thing, I uh, there's a this is a phrase that I used a couple of times in our sessions, old emergency physicians like me do not die. Their sensitivity goes up, their specificity goes down. Now, what does that mean? My sensitivity goes up, it means I've gotten pretty good at picking things up. If you bring a hundred cases, chances are I'll probably find most of those cases or something. But my specificity goes down, meaning my false positive rate goes up, which means you know, maybe she's old, maybe she's a bit feeble, and yeah, maybe she has family, but maybe not. She has a risk of falling. You know what? Put her in the hospital. It's going to cost a bed sheet and three sandwiches. Who cares? And so I just don't sweat that very much. I, I sleep well. The patient loves it. Uh, the, the administration of the hospital loves it. It's the doctors who admit the patients who get irritated. But I'm just very, very cautious, and uh, again, because it isn't what it isn't i.e. that which you ruled out, it's what it might be. Rushing? Uh, you know, I, I think I've only done resident, I've only worked here, and it's one of the reasons I really enjoy working here, um, is not having to worry about that. I, and I, don't, I just don't think I could work in another place, especially like these standing emergency care patient, um, emergency rooms where they turn patients away. I just, I think in my heart, I just wouldn't be able to do that. So again, recognizing who you are, the type of person you are. And there's plenty of opportunities around there, around here. What about you, Brandon? Do you think about the cost of things we do much? You know, and doing my residency here, that did come up a little bit. Um, like, oh, you're ordering that test. Why? Um, well, I don't really have a good reason. Well, do you know how much it's going to cost the patient? Like that kind of stuff. But as far as if, if the patient needs a test or an intervention, no, I don't worry about it at all. Um, that's the, to me, the beauty of working in a critical access county hospital. Um, I see the line item on my property tax statement every year and know how much I personally pay in to support healthcare at Parkland, as does every other Dallas County resident. So um, I see it as kind of my, my duty to society. I love uh, treating uh, the patients that I know may not be able to get good care otherwise. Um, hardly a shift goes by that I don't see a patient that says, well, I went to this other hospital and I have XYZ problem and they said that they can't take care of me because I don't have insurance, but you can go to Parkland and they'll take care of you. I said, well, bring it. Just come on. You know, we're happy to have you. We'll get you where you need to be and get the care you need. One of the things I do love about being part of a large urban center that's county funded is that we actually have an HMO for the indigent uh, it's called, what's, what's it called now? Parkland Financial and the PFA <clears throat> yeah. and, uh, and, and folks that do not have sufficient means to be able to afford insurance who live in the county 
um, can actually have coverage, which means they can get the tests, they can get, they can get their medications, uh, they will have a doctor to see them in a clinic and so forth. So I'm very spoiled about being here because I can take care of my patients here. Now, if the patient's from out of county, uh, who's also indigent, it may be more difficult. And it's a shame that we have this disparity that someone out of the, out of the county might not be able to get care, whereas someone in the county could get the care. But these are just the realities of medicine in the world that we live. Alrighty. And then uh, one of the questions that are out there tonight is, how does the ER look nowadays with, with COVID-19? Are the doctors, nurses, and medical team just wearing PPE? Rashi? Sorry, I missed it. I was typing. What's up? <laughs> uh, well, let me take it. Uh, the, the question is, you know, what does the ER look like covered up in COVID? Uh, the answer yeah. is, of course, we're now about uh, three and a half months into this. Uh, it is worse than ever. Uh, Parkland had almost 100 COVID patients inpatient in about an 800-bed hospital today. Uh, our university hospital had like 35. Uh, we're seeing an enormous number of patients. PPE was a real problem. There was a time when I was a kid that if I had worn the same mask from one patient to the next, they'd have kicked my butt. Who do you think you are wearing that mask on two different patients? Now we wear the same mask all day long, and then they'll take the mask from you and re-sterilize it so that you can then wear it again all day long. Yep. It's a shame that we have to admit in our country that we would have a shortage of such things like this, but it, it is a fact. Um, um, PPE clearly does work, and we have to be very careful. We're, we're having a study right now where 40 of us faculty have volunteered to have our blood drawn for serology and our nose swabbed for the uh, virus. And I am negative four weeks in a row now. Thank you very much. Um, but there's a lot of risk there, don't you think, Rashi and Brandon? Yeah, yeah I was um, telling the paramedics earlier this morning, um, we had a, a meeting system wide here that over the last three months, I've personally uh, intubated or been next to an intubation uh, around 15 times, as well as probably three times that number of what we call aerosol generating procedures, wearing the same raggedy recycled N95 mask, um, switching out only a few times over the last few months, uh, and my ballistic glasses that I wear, some gloves, and um, I'm also antibody negative. So we trust our, our PPE, it's all we have. And, and we put it on with every patient. Um, I'm not going to not go in and take care of a patient just because I'm worried about uh, PPE. Even when um, one of the intubations, I had my mask and my glasses and my glasses are fogging up while I'm trying to intubate, which tells me I don't have a good seal and this was a COVID positive patient. And I thought, well, this is the end of Brandon. It's, it's, it's been a good run, folks. Um, but I didn't get sick and um, antibody negatives. So Brandon and Rashi, if you uh, get exposed to somebody who clearly is highly infected with COVID and you both have kids and a spouse at home, um, how do you feel about that, about going home? And I mean, do you drink the Clorox that we were told to do or what do you do? Yeah, I actually uh, exiled my family for about three months. I have, uh, you know, married with four kids and um, sent them to live with my mother-in-law in, -law in um, California. So. I didn't have to worry about that. Uh, now they're back home. And um, when I get here at the house, I, I strip at the door and streak through my house to straight to the shower. I don't let my kids hug me or, or anything. Um, and I decon. Yeah, it's the same thing. We had this big discussion, my husband and I. I, I ultimately lost my nanny because actually a lot of us in EM, we all, almost a lot of us lost our nannies because they were too scared to work for us. Um, so dealing with that, you know, ultimately my husband's like, if you're going to get it, I'm just going to get it. He's like, I don't, I can't live a life where we're just separate from each other for who knows how long. Um, so it's discussions that we've had. Um, I know tons of people that are living in RVs, different apartments and hotels. It's a part of it. I am a single guy, so I don't uh, have that to worry about. My parents have both passed away already. And so. Uh, I come home and jump in the shower just like y'all do, but um, so I don't, mine's a little bit different from y'all, but I still worry about it. And uh, folks on the, on the call, I wear a mask everywhere I go and you should too. Now I know that doesn't sound 
may be what you want to hear, but folks, we've got to stop this epidemic and we stop it by not transmitting it to each other. Uh, next question, uh, Taylor. Uh, since emergency medicine is so busy, do you ever feel like you don't have enough time to spend with a patient? Um, not as in rushing medical care, but not having the time to actually listen to what they're talking about. I yes, I kind of responded to that in the in in there a little bit, but you know, I it's the whole reason I went into emergency medicine is to talk to my patients. Even if I don't believe what they're having is an emergency, clearly they think they are having an emergency. So I will there is no one telling me that I have to discharge patients. I mean, there's all these metrics and like how many patients you saw per hour, but really talking to a patient and making them feel comfortable takes two minutes. And you learn over time, like how to converse. I have tons, I have like, basically I know like persons coming with gallstones, what, how I'm going to talk about it. And, and you learn again, you understand the patient. This patient has no medical understanding at all. I will take the time to draw, so I will actually draw out their anatomy, they have gallstones, I will draw their liver, gallbladder, pancreas, the anatomy, where their gallstone is, what it means, and what it can be done for it. If I don't have the time, I won't do that part, right? I may discuss it, I may discuss that this organ is here in this part of your body, and you have a stone here, and nothing's bad about going to happen, but I still take the time to do that. Um, you have the time. And if you, if you want to have the time, you have the time. And sometimes it's also making the patients understand that, right? Like, hey, Mr. Smith, like, I'm actually really worried about you, but I just have to take care of something. If you don't mind just waiting, I will come back and I'm going to give you my full attention to just discuss this with you. That takes 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Be like, I see you. I know that you're here. Thank you for your patience. And I'll come and talk to you. Um, and then once they know that, and sometimes just keeping your patients in the loop calms the ER down. Just going by the room, being, I'm waiting for an interpreter. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for your lab results. It takes 10 seconds to just make a loop down, down the rows of rooms. That way the patients understand what's going on and they're not gonna bug you. And then you have more time to devote to them. All right, and since I guess you already touched on that, I'll just move on to another one. So with all the hard decisions you have to make with patients in a given day, how do you go about leaving work at work? like leaving your experiences there at the hospital. Yeah, there's days where you're like, oh man, I really wanna know. That's another part about emergency medicine, I'll say, is like, there's some people are like, they want that continuity of care. Um, sometimes, sometimes I want that continuity of care. I'm like, I really wanna know what happened to like that ankle dislocation, did it look good, what did ortho think? Like you leave and you wonder, and then the other days you're like, I don't really care. Or you're like, look at, the, if you want to care, you look at the chart, you're able to go back, like, oh, this is what they did. Cool, move on. You know, um, and now, and then there's continuity in care in that patient pattern, right? Now I know like taking care of ankle fractures the next time I see one, how to deal with it and how to stay on top of it. Um, yeah, I, uh, on a personal note for me, uh, especially when I, when I was a lot younger, but um, I just put that quest base exam and the pin code up there. Um, there were times I cried all the way home. I mean, this has been some time. Um, deeply moved <clears throat> by cases, some of which I've written about on my website. Um, it's okay to mature and not be a child and to grow into things and become an adult and make wrong decisions, try to make it right, stop making wrong decisions, move to different places in your life. And uh, uh, I find that Emergency medicine has been a very interesting specialty to get old in, <clears throat> and I am pushing 70 very hard. So it's been, it's, but it's been a good field. It, it works for me because I have residents that I work with, which helps me, uh, and they end up being partners in the healthcare there. But <clears throat> the part that, and there was a question about this, <clears throat> of when did you stop second guessing yourself? Um, well, I think, a couple of things happen is that you just have to see an awful lot of patients. I've seen my first 200,000 patients now, so I've been around for a while. And so if you really pay attention to your practice, <clears throat> then you will stop second guessing yourself. Okay. Brandon, any comments or thoughts about that? one? No, I'm um, starting my seventh year out from graduating medical school, um, third year out from training. So I, I still consider myself fairly novice and I probably have, um, I don't know, somewhere around 
30,000 patients under my belt as a physician. And um, that's not including um, all the years I was a, a paramedic going back to the early 2000s. So um, I tried to approach every day uh, with humility, uh, every shift and um, learn from every patient. Every patient is um, just as much of a teacher to me as you know my med school uh, faculty. Um, and uh, two of my uh, residency faculty are uh, at least on my computer screen, flanked on either side of me right now. Um, so they also uh, contributed to, to my knowledge here. And then another question we have is, how do you deal with feeling like you can't do enough for a patient? Like, I guess, I don't really know the context, but I guess it would be like, there's just no other options for you and that you, when do you give up, when do you stop? If it's to that point. There are several types of that. One is a fellow, you know, I know I bring up alcoholism, but one in 10 Americans are alcoholics. It's all over the place. Or the drug deal. We see a lot of heroin. Um, I finally saw some K2 again by Brandon and Rushi. Um, there are people that are lost in themselves and they're very hard to help if you can help them at all. The important thing is to be a doctor and not to be judgmental which means you offer them the opportunities, you offer them help. And, and perhaps there is some underlying cynicism in your mind that says they ain't gonna take it. But at least you do the right thing and you continue to offer them help. Another type of patient, as you said about being able to do enough for them is say someone who is not of financial means and they really are not well and they uh, have severe chronic illnesses and just are holding on by themselves financially by their fingernails. And, and these are folks that we don't have a lot of options to help. We have shelters for the folks that are homeless and so forth. So, you know, I try to get, as I know Rashi and Brandon do, get to get social work involved <clears throat> to see if we can surround them with some kind of assistance to help them with their, with their problems. Rashi, any comment about that? Yeah. Uh, let's take one more, Taylor. We'll probably knock off. Alrighty. Um, one of the questions was, what do you do if you have more patients than you can handle? Again, it's communicating. Uh, communicating with the nurses, um, using them as your second hands. And then sometimes I will call, you know, um, the, the charge nurse that's bringing patients back, she doesn't understand what's going on in your pod. I will call her and be like, hey, like this patient's turned psych on me. It means like I'm gonna have to sedate this person or this patient is getting really rowdy or I have someone decompensating. So again, you know, that pod is your pod. You're running that. You need to know how to do that and making other people aware of it. So again, communicating. And that's why I said step one is always introducing yourself and finding out the nurse's names because you're gonna need them help if it gets too overwhelming from you. And then recognizing when you do get overwhelmed, I'm not gonna lie, like we're a very busy ER. So there's time, there's shifts where all of a sudden, like I realize that I'm tense, I'm angry or I'm sweating. And so recognizing I'm in that moment and taking that two minutes to walk away, go to the bathroom, drink some water, eat a snack. But just two minutes, tell your whole team that, like I need two minutes for a mental break and I'll be back. And then, uh, and then you're a totally different person. You come back totally refreshed and it doesn't take long. But again, recognizing yourself to get there. The flip side of that is that at Parkland, at least, we do occasionally just, we're drowning in patients. <clears throat> we have 115 beds. We may have 250, occasionally 300 patients in the emergency room, which means the waiting room is packed. This is an extraordinarily bad time to have a waiting room packed. Uh, you know, not being able to maintain social distance and so forth. And so you just get to the point of doing the best that you can. Don't dawdle, keep moving. Use, as Rashi said, your nursing resources and your tech resources and so forth to try to move the patients. But there does reach a point where you just have so many, it may be hard uh, to, to be efficient. And, uh, and then you end up triaging and bringing the sickest back first. Well, <clears throat> um, but what a great like session. This, yeah, go ahead. I like this question. I just really like this question about how do you balance your own health? Um, because I, I actually feel like doctors are probably the worst patients, right? We, we really are. And 
Um, I think it took me maybe like until about three years ago to have a really good regimen, like understanding uh, to say no, right? There's always gonna be things, can you do this project? Can you do this? Can you do this leadership position? Understanding that that's, I say yes to this, I say no to something else. Recognizing what you want. And then I have a routine now. So I try to always have Mondays and Fridays off. I'd rather work a Saturday instead of a Monday. And that's just how I am. I always work out Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, no matter what. I meditate almost every day. And so I've, I've learned that I need these things for me. Again, that introspection. Um, but now is your time to develop habits. It's easier to do it later, or it's easier to do it earlier on than later. How about you, Brandon? What's been your uh, clue to survival as a, as a husband and a father and third career guy? And, uh, you know, how do you find that sweet spot that lets you maintain that mellowness that everybody knows about you? <laughs> uh, well, that's... Uh... I'm honored, but I actually don't feel like I have achieved that uh, sweet spot yet. My, my wife uh, keeps me uh, honest and reminds me whenever I'm off balance, uh, which is quite frequently. Um, when I, I have a problem with um, saying yes too often, I, I want to be a people pleaser. And in academic medicine, especially early in my career, where I am trying to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do scholarly work and write and teach and treat patients. And I'm also uh, an EMS guy. So I, I do protocols, education, I do public health. And that's too much. That's too much for me to do. And, and also try to be a good husband and, and father to my four young kids who are growing up way too fast. Um, and I'm, I'm missing things that um, I should not be missing. So I'm still learning. Um, I have mentors, as I recommend each of you get. I have mentors who have made mistakes and uh, are willing to tell me what those mistakes are and are honest enough with me to uh, knock me over the, the head, thank you, Dr. Fowler, uh, whenever I need it. So um, I listen to people smarter than me. That's how I learn. Um, and for those that are new to the sessions, uh, Brandon, among other things, aside from being a boarded emergency doc and EMS doc, is also a SWAT tactical medicine doc. And so... Could I get a quick round of chats of who would like to hear a session on tactical medicine and SWAT medicine? If we see at least 10, oh, I just got 100. <laughs> so Brandon, you're hooked. Uh, late July, 1st of August, maybe you could come join us. Uh, yeah, no, I especially. People, um, I think 200 time, people have just written in. Yeah, especially in the times now uh, with, um, you know, all, all the push for police brutality, racial tensions. Um, yeah, we, uh, we have a lot to learn and teach about this. Well, it's um, a tremendous session. I want to start with uh, thanking Taylor for heading it up and putting it together and um, you know, b being the person for the slides and all that. I want to thank the whole working group. You're such wonderful people to be putting together the email list. Uh, folks, we have a survey coming out soon. We'd like to hear some more about your shadowing experiences or if you have trouble finding them so we can actually write that up and see if there's a way to help that. And then especially, Rashi, thank you so much. <laughs> what a wonderful talk. You're so, you're so sweet. You're such a wonderful doctor and you've graced us with your smiling presence and your expertise and your, your womanhood and your motherhood and your wifehood and just thank you so much for being willing to share this time with us. And so, uh, and I see two, 200, yeah, thank you so awesome. much. And I, I, I mean, I just to all the participants here, like taking this time out and your time to do this in an evening, this is awesome. Props to you guys for trying to do this for yourself and your future. Just, you guys are already like steps ahead. Um, so good luck to you guys. So, uh, Miss Taylor, you want to close it out? Um, bye. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I guess tune in for next week's session. We're going to be talking about COVID and uh, be ready for the quiz, I guess. All right. And the, uh, I put the link on the chat, and the link is also on the website for the exam. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. And we appreciate 500 of you coming to share your time with us. Have a great evening. Good night. Good night.